Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It's Tuesday, August 2nd, 2011, and our special guests today are Jane Nelson and Mary McGuire. And while we were waiting for Mary to come on, Jane, does she go by her, is that a middle name, or does she go by that as a first name? Mary. Yeah, just Mary. Just Mary? Yeah. Anyway, this is really delightful for me. Jane and I have a lot of history here, that, uh, as you're going to get to know. And I uh, we'll really appreciate uh, Jane and Mary being on the show. Future of Education is sponsored by Learn Central and Blackboard Collaborate, and my Web 2.0 Labs project, which is at web2.0labs.com. Look at the huge logo for the Library 2.011 Virtual Conference, November 2nd and 3rd, uh, online and free, two days, 24 hours a day. Should be just a blast. We're getting a great response to this event. It's at library2011.net or .com, all about the future of libraries. Also in November, our second annual 2011 Global Education Conference, the 14th to the 18th, five days, 24 hours a day. Lots of fun, again, a free event online uh, with hundreds of speakers. Coming up on the Future of Education this Thursday, Jim Mayfield. He's going to talk to us about humanitarian work and creating environments for self-determination. I promise you there's a very cool link with education, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, Carol Black, who came on the show and talked about her movie School in the World, touched on a number of the themes that I think we're going to end up talking about this Thursday night. Next week, Doug Rushkoff on his book, Program or Be Programmed, uh, Alan Blankstein on Scaling Excellence, uh, lots of fun coming up. Bob Compton, whose movie Two Million Minutes uh, generated a lot of buzz, has a new movie out called The Finland Phenomenon narrated by Terry Wagner from Harvard, and Bob's going to come on the show on August 25th. Uh, so lots more fun coming up. If you've missed the show, they are all recorded. They're in full Luminate versions or in an MP3 portable audio file. You can also get them as part of a podcast. So just go to futureofeducation.com and look for the links. So now's your chance to show us where you're listening from, and this is the new version of Illuminate, so first I have to know, make sure I know where to give you permissions. Okay, to the left of the whiteboard you should be seeing some icons, and you're looking for the little stars, the second icon down, and then you click on that, and then you click on the map. And it's a lot of fun if you also do a shout out in the chat, letting us know where you're listening from, maybe the time or the temperature. Cottonwood, Arizona. Looks like we have a North America. Oh, well, I'm hoping that's South America. We certainly seem to have a Western Hemisphere crowd tonight. Looks like we may have someone from China. Peggy, oh, is that next. Susie? So I'm hoping that that wonderful noise is maybe Mary. Are you there, Mary? Yes, I am. Finally. Thank you. Hooray! So I thought it might be kind of fun to start out with a quick uh, autobiography from each of you. Uh, this is a very fun event for me because Jane and I go way back. So Mary, why don't we start with you, and would you let us know a little bit about yourself? Sure. My name is Mary Jamin Blair, and I've been working with children and families for about 40 years, primarily in the nonprofit sector, uh, with schools um, at various stages in my career particularly two level five schools. 
So my specialty is working with kids with severe emotional and behavioral challenges. And I've been involved with Edlerian psychology since about 1975. I have a degree from the Ash Institute in Chicago and became seriously involved with positive discipline with Jane in the early 90s. Well, Mary, I think you should also mention that you're a past president of the uh, National Association for Adlerian Psychology, or the North American okay. Society of Adlerian Psychology. The North American <laughs> Society of Adlerian Psychology. I'm also a founder, the director, and a therapist at the Adler Center for Family and Community in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I've, where I've done all my work. Um, and I have a master's degree in counseling psychology. That's terrific. Thank you, Mary. And Jane, I'm hearing a little echo when Mary yep. talks, and I think it's coming from your microphone. So if you don't mind, just turn your mic off when you're not talking, and I think that echo will go away. Okay. Well, it happens. I also turn it down. That might. But, uh, it, just, yeah. it just keeps going up. I'll just, I'll just turn it off when she's talking. Yeah, but don't turn it off yet, because I'd like you to introduce yourself. And you, okay. you and I have this great connection in Thai. Um, and and I, it was interesting to me. It feels like so much of my thinking about so many Ladies topics in education uh, actually are one for the significantly influenced Wayne, by the training I did with you in positive discipline material. So again, just a short, quick autobiography. Oh my goodness. Well, um, I have a doctorate degree in educational psychology, but as I always tell everybody, my uh, greatest credentials is being the mother of seven and grandmother of 20 and uh, have written about 20 books. But I heard, uh, I saw Danielle Steele the other day, and I'm not impressed with my 20 anymore because she's written 120 books. And, um, and now just really pleased uh, to be a part of the Positive Discipline Association, which is a nonprofit organization which now handles all the training in positive discipline to certify people. And we now have trainers all over the world. In fact, I think that the person from China, Susie, I hope that she was, she was going to try and be on. Uh, and we have people in uh, Mexico and Colombia and New Zealand, uh, Iceland and uh, Paris. So we're uh, spreading out all over the world now. So I wonder, Jane, does my training 20 years ago still qualify me to describe myself as positive discipline trained? Yes, and as certified, and we wish you would come back. We miss you. <laughs> well, we're going to have to do that. I started reading the new version of Positive Discipline. I just got to tell you, I love that book. Well, thank you. Remember, we almost wrote one together. I know, but I certainly certainly didn't have the, um, the background for it, but I'm really glad that you've done so much in, in what you've done. Hey, so I want to move on because tonight's fun for me, and Jane, again, I'm going to actually turn your mic off when you're not talking just because I can hear a little bit of echo. Uh, I want to tie some threads together today that feel very significant to me, and we've talked a lot about them in, in the interview series. Um, first, I want to cover the Adler, have you cover um, the Adlerian principles and their impact on the family and the classroom. And then I'm hoping to look at sort of the broader scope of rising equality and democracy in the world. Um, including in education, and then to think about the implications of Adlerian thought with regard to them. Uh, the dialogue right now on education reform is enormously caustic, and it feels uh, like it needs an injection of wisdom. So I'm hoping that uh, that's what you both bring tonight. So uh, Mary, who was Alfred Adler? Who was Alfred Adler? Well, most people think about Freud, Adler, and Jung as the trio that started the current field of psychology. And Adler and Jung had a disagreement with Freud, a couple disagreements with Freud, and moved off and started their own school of psychology. So they started in the early 1900s to talk about people and, and how they operate and why we are who we are and developed into what is typically called Adlerian psychology, although um, it was mistranslated early in the in the beginning of the school and is often uh, in print called individual psychology. But um, that's who Adler was. 
So Jane, why don't we hear more about Adler? I mean, I think pretty much everybody knows the name Freud and the name Jung. Why don't people know the name Adler? Oh, and you got to turn your mic back on. Thanks. Sorry I made you do that. I think it's because Adler and most of his followers are more doers than writers and researchers. And we, we're just so busy out there talking about equality because Adler was way before his time in talking about equality. He really believed that all races of people, men, women, uh, that even children should be treated with equal dignity and respect. And uh, which was not easy for him to do because he was living in Austria during the Nazi reign and, and actually had to leave the country uh, so that he could talk about his work and came to the United States and actually died the year I was born in 1937. But he was uh, very much talking about this equality and how we are all social beings. Whereas Adler's, I mean Freud's, uh, main emphasis that were on the sun sexual beings and Adler talked about us being social beings and that uh, cooperation is the ironclad rule law of social living. And so talking this about the importance of um, what he called Gemeinschaftsgefühl, which has been translated as social consciousness or social interest or social feeling, he just felt that that was very important uh, for society to be successful and for people to be mentally healthy. He thought the measure of a mental health was people's uh, amount of social interest, concern for their fellow man. So that seems Mary, so... Want... Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to know if Mary wanted to add anything to that. Well, an example that's really um, very concrete of Adler's view of people being equal and being able to contribute in different ways are the organizations which Jane mentioned. And if you join the National Association of Social Workers or the American Psychological Association, similar organizations, there's all kinds of criteria and you can't join as a full member if you're not licensed and degreed and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the society, the North American Society of Adlerian Psychology is open to everyone. Everyone's an equal member. So our members include psychiatrists, parent educators, parents, teachers, um, people who are from the business community who just have an interest in psychology, and there's no hierarchy within the organization. Everyone is welcome, everyone's equal, and the idea is that everyone has something to contribute. So if you go to a workshop or a conference, you're likely going to get a very mixed group of people talking about the issues, not isolated by degree or level of experience, and I find that to be very rich. So I don't know if, Selena, you were meaning to raise your hand. If you are, we're going to wait to do that for the Q&A, but you're certainly welcome to put a comment or a question in the chat right now. So Jane, I'm, uh, this is so interesting to me because, uh, again, I see so much of my own beliefs reflected in the descriptions that you just gave. Uh, and I also feel as though if we were to look kind of pragmatically at educational practices, that Adler probably has had more impact than Freud or Jung. So could you describe some things that you see in education that you think are directly from uh, Adler? Well, I do think that there seems to be this running conflict, actually more between an Adlerian philosophy and a behavioristic philosophy. You know, the behaviorism is all based on punishment and reward and all this external motivation. And uh, the, the Adlerian concept, we really believe in encouragement more and in uh, inner locus of control, really trying to help students and when parenting children do the right thing when no one's looking. And so we're trying to be more influential in the schools in having children have a voice, having them be involved in uh, class meetings, for example, whenever there's a problem, it goes on the agenda. And the kids are so great when they have the training to come up with solutions that are respectful to everyone and that are helpful instead of this idea of even logical consequences today, which is so prevalent. Uh, and most people think that uh, logical consequences is great, but if you examine it closely, it's just poorly disguised punishment, which is still designed to make kids pay for what they've done. 
And uh, in the Adlerian philosophy, we're really trying to move toward helping children learn from what they've done in a safe environment where mistakes are opportunities to learn and they're always treated with dignity and respect. So Jane, this is part of a larger story and I'm going to tell it the way I see it and then hopefully you'll correct me or improve on it. But this the story of a growing uh, uh, worldwide sense of democracy or equality um, that at least in North America we, we've seen quite a bit with regard to the family and sort of changing relationships and structures in the family. Um, are you, do you feel comfortable giving sort of a quick overview of how that dynamic has changed and what its implications are and how Adlerian principles make a difference there? Well, yes, you know, one of the ways that uh, Dreikers talked about this is that many years ago we used to give a mo children a model of submissiveness. For example, um, dad obeyed the boss, mom obeyed dad, or at least gave the impression that she did, and uh, then the children obeyed the parents. But when, as he said, when dad lost control of mom, they both lost control of the kids. And I think that, uh, and the reason is, is that they're not giving a model of submissiveness, and so it takes training and a whole new mindset to work toward cooperation. And Steve, the thing that I keep seeing is that people seem to go from extremes. It's, you know, it's like when everybody in our society and worldwide now are wanting freedom, dignity, respect, they're wanting the more democratic model. But in our schools and in our parenting, it is so easy to go to one extreme or the other, either being too controlling or people who don't want that because they see the damage of being too controlling and too punitive often go the other extreme of being too permissive. And so then kids rule the roost and, or the classroom, and so other parents and teachers say, well, we don't want that, so we go back to control. So it really takes training, uh, teaching kids skills. We think that the skills of, of democracy are the skills of treating each other with dignity and respect and mm -hmm. focusing on solutions, and it, it takes training. And it's as important as reading, writing, arithmetic, science, and, and yet so many um, teachers especially, they don't want to take the time, they just want to focus on the academics. And we just think it's very important to uh, focus on, as, as we'll get to later even on, the need of all people to belong and to feel significant, and feel, and especially for children, and when they don't feel that, that they misbehave. So I'm going to give a little clue as to why this is such an interesting topic for me, and that is because if our societies are increasingly becoming egalitarian or um, democratic, depending on how you define that word, then we need to be teaching the skills that allow people to operate in that structure, and certainly that should happen in the family and in education, and that's where I want to go, uh, ultimately, as we talk tonight. But before we do, Jane, the, the phrase positive discipline seems to encompass polarities, those two extremes. Uh, it, it feels like that was sort of a stroke of brilliance to, to have a title that uh, sort of uh, encompassed both or allowed for both. I'm um, assuming that was purposeful. And Jane, I'm sorry, you've got to turn your mic back on. Oh, okay, all right. Do you know, the thing that I noticed is that people really wanted to talk about discipline. How do I discipline my child? How do I discipline? And so I do think it was kind of a stroke of genius, whether I knew it or not, to call it positive discipline because people would then be attracted to it because they thought they could learn to discipline in a punitive way, in a positive way. <laughs> so, so I thought I would just get them in the back door and then teach them, no, no punishment, no rewards, no praise, none of that external stuff and uh, teach them the skills for uh, collaboration and cooperation. So Peggy made a comment in the chat that I was assuming the word discipline is a negative term. And I think what's interesting to me is that um, it feels as though we're kind of cognitively wired to kind of swing to one of the two extremes. We certainly see that in a lot of uh, uh, political debate and that we need coaching to kind of balance those ideas that maybe exist as uh, what I'm calling polarities. So um, 
Mary, you're going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how you've seen the development of Adlerian thought in practical application in schools. I didn't hear part of what you said. Adlerian thought, what? Oh, in practical application in schools? Oh, in practical application in schools. Yeah, as Jane's been saying, it's teaching children lifelong skills um, from the very beginning. And I think often what we do with kids, especially in schools, is we want them to sit down, shut up, and do what I tell you today. But when you get out in the workplace, I want you to think for yourself. I want you to be independent. I want you to be creative. And it doesn't really work that way. If we teach children from the very beginning to have some structure and some responsibility and respect, of course, but also to be full participants, to be able to, to share what they're thinking and what they're feeling, to be participating in discussions, to figure out what they think and how they can contribute. It's, it's a much more worthwhile um, exercise for everyone. So classroom meetings, for example, they're, they come directly out of this thought, right? They do. I think there's some other people who, I know there are now, I don't know who first came up with a classroom meeting, but certainly it's a um, cornerstone of Adlerian psychology. We also talk about family meetings, and many businesses and organizations um, use the model for business meetings and um, staff meetings. So Jane, uh, with all due respect, I mean, 20 books is a lot of books. And, and you know, if I mention your name, oftentimes people will recognize it. But I, I guess I'm not convinced that this has actually become sort of the predominant thinking about education. So why might that be? Why is it that we are resistant, that we wouldn't know the name Adler, that many classes wouldn't be holding classroom meetings? What stops us from doing that? And thanks for turning your mic off, but you got to turn it back on. Turn off. Are you there? Jane, I don't see your mic off. Okay, so am I on? Again. Am I on now? You are. Okay, I haven't. I've lost track of which is on and off. Okay, so I wanted to go back to the idea of. Uh, polarities. And I think that as human beings, we seem to think in polarities, either or. And you know, based on the work of was it Ben Johnson or Barry Johnson, I can't remember, but he talks and gave the analogy of uh, we need to think in and instead of either or. And for example, the example we like to give people is what is you think about breathing, when you breathe in and you breathe out, those are total opposites. And you can't do either or. You have to do both to, to mix sustain life. And a primary foundation of positive discipline and Adlerian thought is to be both kind and firm at the same time. And I think, I don't know whether it's because of the way the brain works and sometimes when we're upset that we uh, go right into the fight flight and then we get too firm and then we feel guilty and then we become too kind. Uh, but it's, it's a skill and it, to learn to be both kind and firm at the same time, and yet it's much more effective. So I'm interested for those of you who are in the chat, um, if Peggy says tough love, she's asking a question, and we'll let, uh, uh, we'll let Jane address that in a second. But uh, for those of you who are in the school environment, uh, what are the polarities that you balance? And, um, you know, I'm not sure we necessarily think of positive and discipline necessarily in the classroom, although it's a good construct. But is it structure and engagement, or, or what are the polarities that you end up balancing in the classroom? And while we're looking for answers in the chat, Jane, do you want to uh, answer Peggy's question about does tough love have a place in positive discipline? Well, I think that tough love is a great example of polarities. And I think that sometimes uh, kids go into misbehaving or because they've been pampered. Let me just say this. Let me go back and give a foundation for this. Adler used to say that children had three main problems in life. They were either uh, pampered or they were neglected or they were handicapped at a time when handicap was still pl not politically incorrect. But he said and the biggest problem with being handicapped is not the handicap itself, but the children are either pampered or neglected because of the handicap. 
So when you have children who are too pampered or too controlled, and then they rebel, but especially if they're too pampered and then they act entitled, and then they want to go back to control. And so I think that the tough love, anything time I've seen, any examples of it, it's more tough than love because they've waited almost till it's too late. And then they also don't really know how to be both kind and firm. They go right back to the tough punishment, logical consequences, and so often it just creates more rebellion. So I want to paint a little picture of where I think we may be socially. And, and Mary, get your response to this. So if we've seen um, the internet really create a broader cultural shift towards um, equality, or at least the ability to have a voice, and we're seeing this sort of take hold in the Middle East and other countries where the people want a voice in governance and the like, um, the institutions are often reacting by shifting to control, to try and take back control or even exert more control than existed before. Are there any lessons to be learned from Adlerian psychology on how we might uh, interact with those institutions when they start controlling uh, at a time when they should be ceding some of that control? Yes, I think so. And I'm also, uh, I didn't mention, I'm very active in, in the community and often I'm involved in uh, political issues where there's two, two strong sides and People are trying to make a decision, for example, do we have green space or do we have industrial land? And this concept, Rikers talked about it all the time, Rudolf Rikers, that it's not just the classroom, it's the community, it's world world wars, it's, it's all of the conflicts people have around the world um, can respond to the same principles. And the biggest issue I see is that people are afraid of democracy. They're afraid to hear what people have to say. And the more people are prevented from speaking, the, the more loud, dangerous, angry, violent it becomes. We had an incident a number of years ago here with the school board where they made a decision that the community was very upset about, and their response was to hold meetings um, to which the public were not allowed, which I think was also against the law, but in any case, it just made people more angry, and they showed up anyway and knocked down doors and et cetera. But if you can set up an atmosphere, whether it be a classroom meeting or a community meeting or whatever, where people can speak and all be heard. A positive discipline talks about separate realities, and that concept that we don't all have to see things the same way because we won't, and we don't all have to think the same way, but we can listen to each other, respect each other's points of view, and then come to a solution. And usually the solution is somewhere in the middle. It's not usually either side winning. And if all we're going to do is sit there and try to win, it's not going to work. And we see that with our political parties at this moment in the United States where the two sides seem to be just fighting each other for their own way without sitting down and getting creative. Or It's not always compromise. That's the word a lot of people are afraid of. It's more coming up with creative solutions. How can we all get what we need? How can we talk this through? And democracy is messy, and it takes time. And that's the other piece. People aren't willing to take the time or to work through some of the issues. So long-term, it's more effective. Short-term, it can be a hassle. So this is so interesting to me, and I, I really love that you're, on, you're both on the show. Uh, we had a professor from Harvard on called, named Tony Wagner who talked about how um, rather than pushing decisions down to the local school districts, it really helped to allow this, the local school communities to brainstorm and participate, and that they almost always came up with the same solutions. It's just that participation was so critical and so key. And we had um, totally. we had a woman on who, who described the future search methodology, which is a way of sort of affirming everybody's perspective. Uh, it's a it's a way of gathering a group together, and the first part of that activity really affirms the different perspectives that people have, and then helps them to uh, work together. So I, I love that you've brought that into this conversation because it feels as though that's kind of critical. So Jane, what what skills specifically? do we need to make sure we're giving students right now to be in this this world, this age of democracy? 
Well, one is to listen to children. It's like it's amazing to me that we're also afraid to listen. And uh, it's like I, I think that they're afraid that if we give kids any power at all, they'll take over. And so, you know, when we teach class meetings, we actually teach the eight building blocks for cl class meetings where we actually teach kids to listen to each other and teaching them to brainstorm for solutions that are respectful to everyone. And what I have found is when you listen to children, uh, they come up with wonderful solutions. And as uh, Larry said, participation allows buy-in, and this is so true. Like in the, a very simple thing, and I know that a lot of teachers do this, but they did it 20 years ago, is to ask students in the very beginning, what should our rules be? to have a respectful classroom. And the kids come up with the, all the same things that the teachers used to come up with, only there wasn't the buy-in. And the other thing is, is that when kids are involved, they feel so much more capable. I also believe that children innately want to contribute and want to help, but it has to be drawn out of them. And they have to have a, a place where they're allowed to contribute, and then they feel so good about doing it. And when they're not allowed, it's just like a four-year-old who's not allowed to do anything or help just gets rebellious. And I think that students who are not respectfully involved either become approval junkies or, re or rebels. So there was an event this last week in Washington, D.C. It was kind of a march for schools that would, if, if we're looking at sort of two different reform camps, was definitely in the sort of progressive camp. Um, and it attracted, I think, something like 5,000 people, which in the scope of things is, is a pretty small number. So, uh, and if we're looking at this reform debate right now, it certainly feels as though the high stakes testing uh, message is winning. So do either of you have any thoughts about how we might kind of thoughtfully within our own communities um, help shift that message or at least introduce the, the vision that, that comes from um, Adlerian principles? You know, I think that it's just that we have to continue to talk about the middle. You know, somebody asked the question about tiger momming. Does it have a place in Adlerian psychology? And really, Tiger mommy went to the two firm, and then uh, the other polarity is too kind. And so it is just always trying to put this out that there is something in the middle. In fact, I think we're in the process of writing a book called Tiger Mom, Permissive Parent, or Something in the Middle. And that something in the middle is uh, where you're both kind and firm. I just keep saying that. Uh, and to get kids involved and to know how much uh, the more peaceful the classroom is when kids are involved. They're just so good at it when we let them, when we give them the opportunity. Mary, any thoughts? Um, I would agree. I, when there's children with behavior problems, very few people seem to ask them what, what they're thinking, what their goals are, why they did it. And I don't mean the accusatory, why'd you do that? Well, we all do that. But more of the sit down and talk about what's going on. What did you think would happen? What are your other choices? And listen to kids and give them that voice to 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 talk about what's going on with them and to teach them other other choices. We don't listen to kids very well. So Mary, tell me about uh, the phrase social interest and and what you think it's describing. Uh, social interest has been called the most difficult term to explain in Edlerian psychology. In some ways, it's very simple, and I'm going to give some background on it. When children are born into their home, whatever that home is, whether it's a biological home or a foster home or whatever, um, they decide whether or not they feel that they belong in that home. It's not based on reality. It's based on their feelings. If they feel the belonging in their home, when they go out into the community, to their daycare, their school, whatever, they they're, they are more secure and decide whether or not they're going to feel belonging in the next group that they're part of. And this goes on through life. If we generally feel belonging and connection with the, with the families and communities that we're part of, we eventually, can, well, not eventually, but we gradually contribute to those communities and feel connected in a very um, 
spiritual way with all of humankind, all of the animals, the universe, and we just know that we're a part of it, and we just because of who we are. We don't have to prove it. We don't have to earn it. We're just part of it. And we also feel a responsibility to contribute and to make things better and more whole. That's social interest, the giving back and the feeling connected. Jane, does, does social interest allow us in any way to measure uh, the responses by institutions or, or even to look at the two different sort of forms of reform and to kind of gauge our sense of their appropriateness? Can we use it as a measure? And we've lost your mic again, so I think you have to turn it back on. Okay. I was busy uh, finding the eight building blocks that somebody had asked about, um, and so I, don't, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. So I'm wondering if social interest could actually be a way for us to measure uh, when we think about proposals or school environments or even the reform movements. Can, could we actually use social interest as a form of measuring when we look at uh, how something's being done, determine is it actually promoting social I interest wish, or not? I wish we would. Uh, to me, it would be the solution to all the world's problems. It's like uh, so social interest really is a concern for your fellow man, for your community, and not only a, a concern, but a willingness to act in the, in the interests of everyone, not just uh, special interests or selfishness, but in really willing to act in a way that, is, that meets the needs of everyone. And so, yes, I think that it would be, you know, when we, in our class meetings, we have what we call the, the four R's of uh, what used to be called of solutions. It's the four R's of solutions, but it needs to be related to the problem, respectful, reasonable, and helpful. So it's actually the three R's and an H. And just think what it would be like if we asked that question, is this solution respectful, related, reasonable, and helpful to everyone concerned? Okay, so we're at the place where we would sort of switch the Q&A here. As you can see, Jane, uh, I, I'm so delighted you sent me that presentation, but we often get so caught in the conversation we didn't, don't even get to it. Um, so let's shift to a little bit of Q&A here. Uh, I, for one, um, love your work, and again, I, I, you know, I'm just going to sort of make that clear here. Um, but if you want to put some links into a uh, book specifically about uh, the classroom that you've uh, written, um, feel free to do that. Peggy's been very good about putting links into your positive discipline, um, to your positive discipline site, and Mary as well. If there are any links you'd like to put in, feel free to put them in the chat. Okay, so uh, did, did you see that I put in the chat that that what is that is is the eight building blocks for what we teach uh, kids uh, about class meetings, and one of the first ones is that they form in a circle, so that that is even taking the position of respect where everybody can see into each other's eyes. And uh, this is from the book uh, Positive Discipline and Positive Discipline in the Classroom, where we go into all detail, a lot of detail, about a democratic classroom and, and how to set up class meetings. So Jane, you may not have hit the enter key, because I don't see that link yet, but I see that you still are typing in there. So, oh, um, and I have to hit enter? <laughs> there you go. There you go. OK, so it looks like we have a question. Um, uh, Susanna wondered, uh, how do we? How do you involve teens? Well, it just so happens well, that we've written a lot to be involved. Am I? Can you? Let's let's let Mary go ahead, and then Jane will let you follow up. Teens love to be involved, but they're going to fight it initially, and I think it's usually because they don't believe the person, the teacher or the parent, we'll talk about teacher, means it. So if you circle up a bunch of teenagers and say, we'd like your opinion on how this school could be run better, at first they're not going to believe you because typically nobody's ever asked them before or they've given their opinion and it hasn't been valued or not that everything they say needs to be implemented, but none of it's been implemented. And so they're going to test you for a while and, and, and see if you really mean it. But if you really mean it, um, 
they, they love to be engaged and to be part of the problem, uh, part of solving the problem and coming up with solutions. And the other key is let them work out the solutions. So if they say, um, I worked with a school group one time, they wanted a new basketball court outside the school. And we said, great, start with a budget. Figure out who makes the decision. You don't just go get them from the basketball court. Let them figure out how to get the basketball court. And if it costs $6 million and there's no way to get the money, then they realize that, oh, you just don't go get a basketball court. But they feel listened to, they feel empowered, and they believe that they really, the people who ask them really want to have them be involved. Jane, did you want to follow up on that? Well, what I would add to that is that when we have controlled children from the time they're to do this, and you know, when parents say to me, my child won't listen, what they mean is my child won't obey. And so they are always trying to get their children to obey and to do what they're supposed to do. Parents talk too much. They tell kids what happened, what caused it to happen, how they should feel about it. And then when they're teenagers, these kids, I they, they, I think it's healthy that they're rebelling. They're saying, you know, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And so Mary's right, though, that if all of a sudden we start saying, okay, now we're willing to listen and involve you, they're not, it's going to take a while to trust. You know, when we first wrote our book, Positive Discipline for Teenagers, the title was I'm on Your Side. It did not sell well at all. Nobody got that title at all. Uh, and it just came from a story from a father who was yelling at his son, and finally he remembered what we had taught about make sure the message of get, the love gets through. And he just stopped and said, son, do you know that I'm on your side? And his son just started to cry and said, how would I know that? And so I think that we sometimes have to say, look, I am sorry. We've been in a power struggle. I can see how I contributed to that. I have not been respectful of you. I want to change. I want to be respectful of you. I know hey, you have so much to offer, and uh, can we start over? And then really do it. So we've talked about a number of the different forms uh, that education is taking now, and, and some of the uh, activities that um, might be even described as disruptive. Homeschooling, chartered schools, other kinds of schools. Uh, we had a gentleman named Jerry Mintz on the show, and he talked about democratic schools. And um, and I went to try and find the one that was in the Sacramento area, and it turned out to, uh, maybe to have closed or, or been gone. Mary, are there particular school systems or thoughts around schooling that you feel really um, follow up there in principles well? Well, we're starting to, I don't know what the word is, but certify something, uh, positive discipline schools around the country. There aren't very many, and I haven't been involved in that process, but what happens fairly often, I worked with one school in Minneapolis, but then the principle changes and the philosophy changes. So it's hard to find schools where there's a consistent, over time, uh, implementation as a democratic school or a positive discipline school. Montessori school. Schools are very compatible with um, positive discipline and Adlerian psychology, and they tend to uh, be more consistent over time. I don't know if they'd call themselves democratic, but the principles are very similar. So it's different. I also worked with a site-based managed school for a while where the classrooms were democratic, the school was democratic, but again, the politics changed and the district changed and they no longer use site-based management. So. I've seen it be very successful, but I haven't seen very many long-term examples. Jane, what about you? So true. I was working with one school up in Washington, and the teachers loved it. Uh, everybody loved it, but the principal did not come. I mean, the principal did not even sit on the, you know, on the train. She was in and out. And they got all through with the training. They were loving it. And then the principal came in and says, okay, now let's come up with a discipline for consequences for playground. And I go, oh my gosh. So it does take leadership uh, of, uh, oh, I should say that this school, it was my, my third time to go there because this, the principal before had endorsed it completely. And so the teachers just went along and it was working very well. And as soon as you changed the leadership, it changed completely. So I think that sometimes it's easier. Parents and principals and teachers often think it's easier to just be controlling and say, do it because I said so. 
And the thing is, is that that's just working less and less effectively. So one of the connections potentially with the way we think about democracy is that we see democracy as a process, that there's a process of dialogue and resolution that oftentimes may not reflect exactly our idea, but we support the process. So it feels like often we don't see education as a process, but we think of it as an outcome. So I'm wondering if there are forms of decision making that allow for kind of the balancing of the polarities. And, and if anybody in the chat knows of a place that you feel like is doing this well, I'd be very curious uh, to see that. Uh, Peggy asked the question, and I'm not sure I fully understand, but maybe you will, Jane. She says, would you consider it a discipline approach or philosophy rather than a discipline program? Oh, I think it is a philosophy because, uh, you know, that's such a good point, Peggy, because I think that sometimes if we try to teach the skills without people accepting the philosophy, they don't get it. It doesn't go to that deep level. One of the things that we really try to teach is how important it is to get into the child's world and understand what they're thinking and what they're feeling and what they're deciding. And uh, if teachers or parents take the skills we teach without understanding the philosophy, it's, it feels like a technique. It doesn't have heart in it. And it backfires often. It just it seems like another way to control them rather than really getting the philosophy. So that's a very good point. You know, we, we often look for results. And, and one of the things that I think was hard for the democratic schools was that they couldn't show results in uh, achievement, whether it was test scores or life achievement, in ways that people kind of expected. Um, which doesn't mean there weren't really positive results, but they just weren't being measured the same way. What kind of ways do you, Mary, think about results when you think about the application of Adlerian principles in families and schools? How do you how do you quantify the outcome for yourself? That's a really good question. And I think the key is we tend to look at long-term results more than short-term results. Not to say there aren't changes and influence in the short term, but it's what I was referring to in the beginning of the program, uh, those long-term results. They're harder to measure. It's really easy to measure how long a child sits in a chair. And some of our IEPs have goals just like that, that the child will sit in a chair for three out of five minutes or a child will repeat instructions or, or follow instructions two out of three times. I'm not sure those are the goals that we want to instill in our students. Uh, how do we measure creative thinking and uh, collaborative problem solving and long-term uh, success with relationships and, and work? And that's a lot harder to measure. And I think that's a challenge that we have. The other piece is that, and I'm going to have trouble articulating this, but the world has a certain way of measuring things and deciding what's appropriate and what's, I forget the word, but the programs the schools can use. And Adlerian psychology in general has had a problem with this from the beginning because the whole philosophy is harder to measure. And so um, it, it's a lot easier to measure, in, and I'm going to do a little sidestep here, but it's relevant. If you're giving somebody medication and you want to see if their behavior changes over time, that's very concrete and very easy to measure. If you're trying to empower someone to, to um, feel more courageous about their behavior and, and to be more active in the community and to have social interest, that's a lot harder to measure. So it's a, this is a serious problem in terms of um, communicating with the rest of the world for agrarian psychology psychology in general and for positive discipline. We've talked a lot on the show about how difficult it is for an educator to do something in the classroom when their own work environment doesn't reflect those same principles. You know, the idea that it would be hard to, to teach in a 21st century kind of environment if your own work environment isn't 21st century. If we substitute the phrase, uh, you know, more democratic or more Adlerian, um, Jane, do you, have you seen schools where they started working first with the faculty and then allowing for it to spread to the students as a natural extension? Well, but I think that first the point that you make is so true is often 
we don't walk the talk as parents. You know, that old idea is do what I say, not what I do. And I think that the same is true in schools. And if you, if you do have um, a, a principal who is being very controlling and not collaborating with the teachers, why would the teachers then collaborate with their students? On the other hand, we have had principals who use the class meeting process in their faculty meetings where they really started with compliments so that everybody was looking for the good and verbalizing it. And then they had, uh, when they had problems, they would put them on the agenda and brainstorm for solutions and pick the ones. So yes, I do think that modeling is the best teacher. Example is the best teacher. And I think that's a big part that's missing. Okay, the so other we, part that relates ahead, to that is, is the difficulty of democracy. And if we struggle with it ourselves, then we have a little more understanding of the kids and how they're struggling and the time that it takes and the process element. So walking the talk is critical. Yeah, I, we're not going to have time tonight, but I am having this sort of very interesting thought process now about uh, our ability to support democratic principles in schools, knowing that they may not often always decide on the same practices that we would, but that allowing them to make that decision is more likely to lead to opportunities for the kinds of change that we're talking about. Um, we've got, uh, we're really at the top of the hour and should finish. We started a couple of minutes late. Uh, Jane and Mary, if I'll offer one or two more questions, are you okay with that? <laughs> I couldn't hear your answer, Jane, but so yeah. I'll say, okay, so uh, if anybody has a final question or two, let's, uh, let's wrap up in a couple of minutes, but um, uh, if you have a question for Jane or Mary, please feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand, which is that third icon in the participant window. If you hover over it, it will say raise hand. Uh, and, see, uh, I see ahead, one Jane. question about the magic circle from the 70s. Uh, I'm not sure if that was glasses, uh, but one of the things about a lot of circles that we see is still where the kids put the teachers put the kids in a circle and teach them lessons. The Adlerian or positive discipline circle is where you have a problem and the kids go around the circle and they come up with their they discuss it and then they have come up with solutions. So it's very student involved more than teacher. Okay, so, uh, so as a final wrap-up, uh, Mary, I'll ask you first and then we'll ask Jane. Um, are, are there any books or things or people that you think we should be following that relate specifically to this discussion of Adlerian principles related to the classroom and then related to teaching skills of a more democratic world? Um, you asked about books, I couldn't hear you. Well, of oh. course, the positive discipline books. <laughs> um, Rudolf Stryker's Children the Challenge is still one of the best books about um, parents and teachers working with children that, that's out there, I think. And well, he talks Mary, a little more about democracy. Yep. Mary, what about the Dreyfus book? On, isn't it called Social Equality? Or what is the name of uh, that book? Social Living or... Uh, it's, it's called Social Equality, The I, Challenge I, of Today. Oh, good for you. There well, you it's, go. it's, it actually, I bought it, and that's what <laughs> precipitated the whole conversation. Oh, good. It's another wonderful book. So, Jane, what about you? Any recommendations aside from the 20 great Jane Nelson Positive Discipline books? Well, I just want to say that uh, there's a lot of brain research that's coming out and that is finding exactly what we've been saying for years about, about how kids respond to control and how they respond to respect. Uh, even the uh, Dweck, uh, Carol Dweck's work on why praise isn't really a good idea, which is, you know, we've been taught so much about how important it is to praise kids and how in the long term it really is not the best thing to do to help them feel confident and be risk takers. Uh, and so the brain research is interesting, except that we sit back and say, well, we knew that already. <laughs> so Carol came on the show, and that was brilliant. Uh, her book's called Mindset, and uh, I really enjoyed that. And in fact, there's a new book out, um, brand new. Uh, I'm trying to remember the. Uh, 
It's Kathy Davidson. It, she's been on the show before, too, and there are a number of really good brain books coming out. Okay, well, let's leave it there. I'm going to clap for both of you. Thank you so much. I'm going, I'm hovering over the emoticon, and I'm clicking on the applause. Thanks so much to both of you for coming on today. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Steve. So that was terrific. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, everybody who's been here. Coming up on Thursday, Jim Mayfield talks about self-determination in villages in Nepal and Kenya. And you'll be, I think you'll be surprised, maybe not, by the great connections with education and how we allow communities to create their own educational solutions. Um, Doug Rushkoff next week, again, back on the show, and Alan Blankstein on Scaling Excellence. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jane and Mary. Have a great night or day, depending on where you are.